Okay, go ahead. Okay, so Gary, are you we, ready? Uh, I, I'm ready uh, if you want to start, but we should remind everyone to please mute yes. uh, uh, during yes. the program. Okay. Um, all right, so we're going to get started. My name is Becky Dam. So I'm the head of archives and special collections at Decatur Public Library. Thanks for joining us this evening. There are a lot of you in here, um, and we really appreciate that. Uh, this evening, we are going to be talking about the history of Fairview Park with Gary Geisler and Dr. Stephen Huss. And uh, Gary is a longtime buddy of ours in the local history room. He used to volunteer in here. Um, and then he stopped, but we wish he'd come back. So please come back, Gary. Um, but he is an avid historian and, and loves the stuff and has been bringing us ideas <clears throat> for a long time now through, throughout COVID um, to bring to the rest of you. And then he's going to introduce Dr. Stephen Huss because I don't think I can do it justice. Okay, well, I want to say that, uh, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. We're fortunate to be joined by Dr. Stephen Huss this evening with his uh, knowledge of the evolution of Fairview Park, his array of photographs. A lot of the photographs that you'll see are photographs that were taken by Steve, uh, some in the air, some on the ground. But uh, Steve is uh, an important participant in our program tonight and uh, has uh, a lot of knowledge about Fairview Park that he's going to share with us. Uh, if you're like me, you have walked through Fairview Park in the snow. You have walked through Fairview Park when the leaves are knee deep. Uh, you have perhaps run laps around Fairview Park. You might have played ball on the field in Fairview Park. Uh, perhaps you've had picnics, family picnics and otherwise in Fairview Park. And if you're like me, you learned how to drive a car in Fairview Park. In, in short, Fairview Park has been really uh, an, an important part of the entire community <laughs> for many, many Fairview years. Park. Fairview Park. Sit here. This is Dr. Huss. Guys, um, everybody. How about you? Don't worry about me. You sit down. I can see. Please, please mute. Thank Gary, you. Gary, let me stop you for a second. Becky, I think you have a way to mute everybody. I do, but I don't want to mute certain people. So <laughs> go ahead and give me a minute. Just one second. Let me mute everybody. And then I will go ahead and unmute the ones that need to be unmuted. All right. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. The uh, newspaper has even referred to Fairview Park back in 1901 as the city's only leisure resort. <coughs> so with that, I'm going to turn uh, the microphone over to uh, Dr. Huss. Um, the, uh, my introduction to uh, Fairview Park uh, started off as a child and uh, I grew up on Fairview across from Milliken and Milliken and uh, Fairview Park were my, uh, my playgrounds. And I've always, I've lived in Decatur most of my life except for the years I was away for education. And um, um, Fairview Park was a place where we could uh, do things like uh, playground activities this picture you're looking at right now actually is El Dorado, which is defined by the uh, red brick street and uh, the red firehouse that soon will no longer be a firehouse. And at the very top of the picture is the new firehouse in Fairview Plaza. You can barely see it. You only see half of it. But that, that red brick street, El Dorado, goes past uh, Temple Benai Abraham and it goes down. It's El Dorado. It goes down to the uh, entrance to Fairview Park. That uh, tree you're looking at right now is, was known as the General Grant Elm tree. Uh, I'll tell you more about it in a little bit. It's uh, in 1880, a U.S. Grant and uh, Oglesby and Logan were generals and they were there and there was a big event in the park. And this tree was a tree they stood under. Well, unfortunately, this uh, 79 foot tall tree with an 88 foot crown and a 15 foot circumference that uh, died uh, a victim of the Dutch Elm disease in 1953 and right behind it on the ground, uh, and way behind it is pavilion number one, but right behind it on the ground is this rock with this plaque on it that's there to this day commemorating that event. 
These are just some articles. Don't expect anybody to try to read them. They're Herald Review Archive articles of that 18, of that uh, great event. Uh, it was great for the city of Decatur in 1880 when everybody, all these people assembled in Fairview Park uh, for uh, Grant's visit. Uh, this uh, this is a plat map of Fairview Park, and uh, it has to be after 1876 because uh, the yellow line depicts the vertical yellow line is Fairview Avenue, and then the horizontal yellow line is Fairview Place. And Fairview Place used to be the actual uh, entrance to Fairview Park. I mean, uh, let's say actual entrance to the fairground that preceded Fairview Park. And uh, later the entrance became El Dorado as El Dorado was extended west uh, near uh, uh, west to the current entrance. There's a fairground there. You can see the racetrack. You can see all those little black objects on the racetrack. Uh, again, I'll say more about that in a moment. This is a picture that I have seen a few times. Uh, it depicts the Macon County Fairgrounds. I believe that is the large amphitheater that supposedly seated about 5,000 people that was on the west edge of the racetrack for the fairground. That's it for those pictures, Dr. Hess. Okay, well, uh, additional comments. Uh, uh, I was gonna say that when we went to the park, uh, it was a very safe place. Uh, we went without our parents uh, when we were little kids. Uh, they gave us a few warnings before we left for hours. Uh, we can all, if we lived in the 50s and 60s and 40s, 50s and 60s, can probably say things like that about how safe we thought our world was. And our parents apparently thought the same thing. The, uh, uh, the, the early fairground, the park, as we know, Fairview started off as 40 acres of farmland purchased uh, from two owners. It was laid out in 1857 by the Macon County Agricultural Association, 1857 and it was laid out specifically for a county fairground site. There were several buildings, including a 5,000 seat amphitheater and cattle and pig sheds and floral halls and product halls and industrial halls and mechanical halls. Uh, there was a racetrack and the long axis as you saw in that previous picture was east to west. And actually the first pavilion, uh, as we'll mention later burned. Uh, and then the second, the recreation re of, that pavilion, which later became the ice rink, uh, was they were both actually inside that racetrack that you're looking at right now, more or less on the top inside portion of that racetrack. I don't know the dimensions of the racetrack. I, I was trying to find that out, but, but couldn't. Um, the, uh, the Macon County Fairs were held there uh, from 1856 to 1884, with the exception of 1863 and 64, and 1869 and 70 uh, when the Illinois State Fair was there and actually the Illinois State Fair rotated to different cities until it finally found its permanent home in Springfield. Uh, the fair grounds, uh, the Agricultural Society uh, sold that to Macon County in 1869 and then uh, in 1890 the city leased uh, that 40 acres of land for a park uh, and then in 1903 uh, uh, as you'll hear from Gary, it, uh, it was sold to the city, or actually the city bought it. They no longer leased it in 1903, they bought it. And then back to the uh, Civil War portion of this, uh, the Civil War 1861 to 1865, uh, there were uh, companies of soldiers in all the regiments of Macon County were organized in the future park. Uh, they, the companies of soldiers uh, were there and they camped until they were mustered into service, until they went off to distant places like Tennessee and Mississippi. Um, and if you can go to that tablet picture, that monument picture, uh, that's under veterans. And uh, uh, on October 6th uh, uh, and 7th, um, can you find that under veterans? It's uh, I'm looking, give me just a second. Yeah, actually it's, it's, a, it's a green tablet and it was just before the tree, but maybe it's not gonna show up. Well, anyway, I'll go on. On October 6th and 7th of 1880, the great event happened. Uh, Generals Grant, Logan and Oglesby and others reunited in Fairview Park for the reunion of the Ma at the Macon County Veterans Association meeting. 
It was actually uh, planned as a reunion of the 21st Infantry Regiment, which was Grant's, Ulysses Grant's first command in the war. So that was 1880. Uh, that monument is just south of third base on the baseball field in the front part of Fairview Park. It's right next to the walking trail. And it was placed there in 1937 to commemorate the 1880 event. It was placed there by the GAR, which is the Grand Army of the Republic, which is the Veterans Association for uh, uh, the Northern States. Uh, this, uh, uh, this event uh, started with uh, Ulysses Grant in Chicago, riding the Wabash to Bement, Illinois, and then taking uh, horse transportation to Decatur, visited various sites on the way, and then there was a mile and a half long procession from, um, that's good enough, we can leave that up there if you can't find that other one. There's a mile and a half procession uh, from uh, the city downtown uh, to the park. Uh, Decatur at that time had a population of about 9,000, uh, but there are estimates about the 40,000 people who attended the uh, two-day event. And in some places it talks about a three-day event, but most, most references I saw were the two-day event. Uh, they called the fairgrounds for that event Camp Sheridan. It just was given a temporary name. Um, uh, for reference, uh, Ulysses Grant died in 1885, and this was in uh, 1880. And it is said that Grant spoke under the tree, and uh, I think he was a man of few words. He said he spoke 100 words. And uh, that was pretty much the it. And then I... I looked, I looked long and hard, and maybe the library has them, but I could not find any photographs that actually showed Civil War activity in Fairview Park. I'd surely, surely like to see that. There were three major regiments that did form down there in the park, the 35th, 41st, and 116th. And there's scads of information about those regiments and what they did, where, they, where the soldiers came from and all that. Um, and... I'm looking to see if I had any other uh, comments uh, to make. Um, yes, Dad. It's very this hard. is uh, the top of Lincoln Hill, and this is a uh, listing of the Civil War soldiers who uh, mustered here in Fairview Park and, uh, and in Macon County, not necessarily Fairview Park. Uh, those are uh, a Civil War cannon on the right, and they used to have wheels under them so they could wheel them into battle. And on the left is well, was a little short thing. Those were uh, mortars. And actually one of those actually has a cannonball stuck in it. So it's kind of interesting to look if you haven't seen those. There used to be an eagle on top of that. And the eagle was removed over the years. Great big copper or brass eagle. And behind that is, uh, well, the Lincoln Log Cabin actually used to be up very close to that uh, monument. So, okay, Gary. All right. Uh, as uh, as Steve uh, made mention, the uh, the area we know as Fairview Park was originally uh, owned by the county, the Macon County Agricultural Society. And then uh, in 1890, the city of Decatur began leasing the ground for use as a public park. In 1903, the uh, city uh, elected to purchase uh, Fairview Park from the county. Uh, the interesting thing is, is that the purchase price was $8,000, but instead of uh, coming up with all that money up front, the city uh, negotiated a transaction whereby they would pay $2,000 a year uh, over four years. So it was not a cash sale, it was installment payments. Not quite sure why that was necessary. There was uh, a contest held uh, for the naming of the park. And uh, the name Fairview got the most votes. It was a combination of fair, which came from fairgrounds, and review, which came from the newspaper. Steve, you told me what the second, the, the number two most popular. That was uh, Columbia. And I believe that was because of the uh, Columbian Exposition. Right, uh, up in Chicago. Up in so, Chicago, the World's Fair. Right. So that, that's how we got the, the name Fairview Park. Uh, a few years after the uh, city bought the park, uh, the city then purchased what's known as the Cato Track. The Cato Track is the front 10 acres of the park, which actually fronts on Fairview Avenue. 
and the city paid $7,000 for that. Uh, Steve may later show us a picture of the Cato House, uh, which was uh, close to the park. Uh, the uh, Catos had purchased or, or had constructed a big uh, dance platform, a refreshment stand, and even a speaker stand on the property, uh, all of which remained for a short time after the city took over the property. Also in 1905, there was a private company that purchased some land, which is now we consider to be the home of the duck pond and the tennis courts, and this became known as uh, an amusement park. Uh, the property was acquired by the city in 1919. Uh, it was used as a, a tourist camp until about 1928. Uh, they charged 25 cents uh, to spend the night. Uh, you know, that was in the days when people were just starting to uh, travel and, and use the highways. And uh, there wasn't a great deal of uh, hotels and motels out and about. And so there were these tourist camps that were formed so that people would have places to stay. And that uh, uh, was one of those. Uh, in addition, beginning at the turn of the century, there was a large and well-attended uh, Labor Day parade, which uh, came from downtown and it entered Fairview Park uh, each year. Uh, ultimately, the Labor Day parade eventually just circled downtown <laughs> and it didn't go all the way to Fairview Park. Steve, I'll turn it over to you. Um, I'll just talk about uh, the entry gates, uh, the entry gate to the park and the pavilions and the water fountains uh, that uh, I sort of cherish. And I'll talk about that and a little bit about restoration of one of them. Uh, in the very beginning, uh, the primary entrance uh, was the entrance to uh, the fairgrounds. And uh, it was via uh, Fairview Place. And you're looking at uh, uh, that one right there. That's the current uh, entrance. And you'll see uh, two stone columns. And uh, they used to be about the width of a car apart. And, but then when the two lane road was put in, they obviously had to be separated. Uh, there's some other photos that show, uh, there's the beautiful Brick Street of uh, El Dorado. I love Brick Streets. I feel great pain when I see the city chew up one for, to, to do something uh, subterranean. And uh, this one was actually threatened, uh, the one in front of the temple and the fire station. And uh, there, was a, there was a vocal effort to uh, protect it and keep it from being asphalted several years ago. You remember when that was, Gary? I think it was uh, maybe in the late 90s. Okay, yeah. And then this is uh, pavilion number one, the first pavilion, the 1896 pavilion. This is the east entrance to it and a beautiful floral garden. Of course, it's winter there, but uh, uh, that, uh, okay, and then this, that be right behind these two ladies sitting in chairs, and this was approximately 1898, uh, you'll see uh, that floral garden back there, and this is the sidewalk, and if you projected a line down that sidewalk, it would go down El Dorado Street towards Fairview. Now, the two houses there, uh, the one on the right exists to this day. And uh, splitting between those two houses a short, is a short segment of McClellan Avenue. The house on the left is the Cato House, C-A-T-T-O, which was mentioned by Gary. And that was a Dr. Cato. And uh, he had a son named Keith Cato and a wife named Florence. And uh, they, uh, they had sold that 10 acres uh, eventually, but his, uh, Dr. Cato died. He, he did as physicians did back then. Uh, he caught a train down to Assumption uh, back when the railroad, Illinois Central, went down to Assumption and he visited a patient. And in a hurry to get back and not miss the last train, he, uh, he got run over by another train. And that was about 1895. And uh, so ultimately she sold that property. But that house, only, that house, uh, was removed possibly within the last 10 years, the house on the left. This is actually almost a, it's a photo, it's a postcard of just about what we looked at, a slight difference, but you can see, go to the next picture. I want to show those columns. Yes. Okay. That's a photograph of the original entrance. So uh, you can see there were six columns, three on the right, three on the left, and an iron gate and an iron fence. And the gate was locked at nighttime. 
uh, and you were supposed to be fined and maybe put in the calaboose if you uh, tried to get through that gate. Uh, pavilion number one is right down that sidewalk. There is no longer a sidewalk that goes directly from that point directly to the pavilion that exists today. Um, that was removed a long time ago. Uh, additional comments, uh, and I'll get to that. So just leave that picture up there or leave that one there, it doesn't matter. And in the beginning, the primary entrance was this El Dorado entry. Uh, later entries were Fairview Avenue, uh, right next to the sorority house, the Alpha Chi sorority house at Millican. Uh, then in 1907, Park Place was uh, developed and uh, that became a, a third entrance to the park. And then there are other entrances at Summit Avenue and Oak Crest and also uh, back when the uh, new section of the park was developed, there actually was a Snake Hill entrance and exit that no longer exists, except they have used it as a service road rarely. Uh, and one other entrance was, uh, which I'll get to when I talk about Dreamland a little more, there was a streetcar that went down from uh, the city, from the uh, uh, transfer house down West Main past Millican entered uh, on its tracks behind the Tridelt House uh, beyond Park Place Avenue, went down to the bottom end, uh, the north end of Park Place and made a left turn west. And that streetcar went down to Dreamland on what's called the Dreamland siding of the uh, streetcar tracks. And they paralleled the interurban train tracks, which, uh, so in 1896, the commissioners uh, approved plans to build a pavilion. And, uh, that was when they built the gate also. The, the pavilion uh, of interest uh, is, was 68 feet by 134 feet, that one in that picture. And it was sandstone brick with iron pillars and iron trusses and a wood gable roof. Uh, the sides were open and it could accommodate 1,200 seats. Uh, the pavilion, this very pavilion uh, in 1961 was going to become the ice rink. And they're going to make an ice rink on its uh, floor. And uh, the, uh, uh, there was a fire. And so the pavilion burned to the ground. And there was allegations that, or beliefs that uh, some boys had set it on fire. But I don't believe anybody was charged, or convict, charged and convicted. Uh, so they worked pretty quickly. The park district worked pretty quickly. And by uh, uh, November 17th, 1962, they opened up. Uh, the brand new pavilion and ice rink. This pavilion was built on the same footprint, but it was 85% larger. That's a 1961 picture of the fire. Actually, it was April 1st, 1961. And 85% uh, larger, the new one. And uh, this, uh, this skating rink, which for some reason I never skated on. I always skated on Dreamland Pond. But I never skated. I know so many people that used to go to Fairview Park, and I, I think it, it finally was closed because the Civic Center uh, had opened, uh, was built, and uh, had uh, uh, taken the ice skating interest, and it was a lot of work to keep that going anyway. Uh, the, uh, uh, I'm just going to say something about, uh, I'll go on and talk about the fountains and, uh, and the, uh, I just think everybody needs to know that, that the uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's uh, presidency uh, created the New Deal. And the New Deal was uh, we had 25% national unemployment. Uh, this picture right here is pavilion number four, the one in uh, the west end, the farthest point west in the park. And there's a gentleman taking a drink out of one of these handmade limestone fountains, which uh, there were four of. Um, Next picture, I think, and and I did. This is this is uh, a little story I'm going to tell in a second. So just leave it there. Uh, the um, uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps was responsible for almost all buildings that you see in Fairview Park. Not Pavilion Number One, but uh, the CCC. Uh, was, uh, they actually had two camps in Decatur. They had uh, Camp Lake Decatur, which was at 18th and Cantrell, just west of, just uh, north of Eisenhower High School. And they had another camp called Camp Macon County, and it was on North Broadway. Uh, not quite clear on exactly the 100 block that it was. Uh, if, if you were in the Civilian Conservation Corps or the Works Progress Administration, you were involved in projects like building roads, building bridges, 
uh, building buildings, uh, conservation projects, uh, soil and water conservation, uh, rip wrapping along the creeks and rivers. And uh, the, uh, the, you had to be 17 to 28 years old. Uh, you got $30 a month, you got room and board free. Uh, $22 out of your 30 was sent to your dependents. And uh, the educational level of these people was not very good. 38% had less than an eight year education. 3% were illiterate and 11% had a high school education. And uh, they worked around uh, uh, the concern by uh, unions uh, that they would compete with unions by just making work projects and really uh, not really competing with them for uh, local contracted projects. The, thing, the places in the park that were built uh, by the CCC and the Works Progress were the, the roads, uh, the pavilions number two, uh, which is the one by uh, the baseball field, number three, which is the one by Fido Field uh, in the new section of the park, uh, the dog park, and number four, the one we just showed the picture of. Uh, they also built the large brick restroom by the baseball field, the refreshment stand, that little brick building, the detailed work that they did is incredible. I mean, if you just look at something as simple as a refreshment stand, you look at the indented brickwork and the layering of the brick, and it's uh, all these structures, including the pavilions, had inlaid wood and, and arches, wood arches. Some of them are post and beam. Some of them had iron. That one of them, that one uh, pavilion number three, has uh, has uh, a fireplace with an iron uh, swing uh, pin that you can put a great big pot on and then swing it back in over the fire, just like you would think you would see in, in the 1700s or 1800s. There seemed to be no end to the talent that these uh, uneducated or lowly educated people had. They also built the horse, horseshoe courts and their uh, croquet courts. There's still remnants of the horseshoe uh, courts uh, right next to the baseball field. The concrete pads they st stood on are still there. Uh, I don't think they built the roquet courts, uh, but they did build the, build the croquet courts. Uh, they built uh, the bridle trails. There were horse trails and hiking trails in the new section. They built two foot bridges over Stevens Creek, one of which is still there. It's the second version of it. And the other one, the footings are still there and it's deep in the woods and most people don't see it. Uh, they put rip wrapping uh, in. They built picnic grounds, grills, tables, fireplaces. They did the Lincoln Log Cabin uh, final restoration or one of the restorations. And then we get down to the four fountains, which are kind of near and dear to me. Uh, a brief story is that uh, uh, this is a fountain. I found uh, there were four fountains in the new section and I found one. I knew where it used to be. And I was just exploring a few years ago and lo and behold, there it was with uh, those large trees having grown over it. It was tilted on its side. And uh, no one would ever have seen it if they didn't know where it was originally, because it used to be out in open ground, but that area reforested and uh, hid it. And the other three are probably consigned to history. Uh, this, uh, this also actually had a Mueller valve uh, still, uh, still they're right there. That's a Mueller valve going underground that served us, so I could tell it had never been moved. And so I, I uh, thought, ah. Uh, I got my good friend John Huff involved in this project and he was enthusiastic as was I. And uh, we got uh, Mr. Clevenger, Bill Clevenger of the Park District and his operations director, Clay Gerhard to help us out. And, and they lifted it out. They had the men lift it out of the woods and put it on the ground close to the iron inner urban bridge. And that picture is a little out of sequence. We actually, that's okay though. Uh, that's after uh, we had it out and, and it looked much better than that. Uh, then someone vandalized it several weeks after we put it there. And we thought uh, my, my desire to put it out so people could see it and respect what had been done in the park was now seemingly destroyed. So then I talked again to the park district folks and uh, said, why don't we, uh, there it is after they pulled it out of the ground. So it didn't look too bad. It was not nicely weathered and had a real cool, uh, uh, a veneer to it uh, from aging, and then someone uh, or people uh, tried very hard to destroy it one night, and that's after it was toppled. The top half, probably a few hundred pounds of it, was thrown off to the side. So uh, we decided to put it over by the baseball field so it would be uh, seen by more people, and so it might theoretically uh, uh, be um, 
uh, less likely chance of vandalism. This is after the restoration. Show that other picture uh, of it. And there it is. Okay, and that's that's a plaque that uh, John and I uh, put the words on it, and it really is to uh, to uh, honor the Civilian Conservation Corps and the work that they did. Uh, we even found that block of limestone it's on deep in the woods, covered up by all kinds of debris and everything, and uh, and uh, so anyway, that's pretty much the story of it. And I'm, I'm happy to see that it's there and a lot of people have commented on it. And that's kind of a squatty looking picture right there. But uh, I guess that's the way the photograph came out when we tried to uh, put it on for display. Um, so I think that uh, you can go ahead and uh, do the next section or is that me? That's me. Okay. It's, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the new section of the park. You're, first, you're going to talk about Dreamland, the duck pond. Yeah. Okay, I'll talk about Dreamland. Uh, growing up, Dreamland was a pond. And up until not too many years ago, Dreamland was Dreamland uh, Lake uh, or the duck pond. Uh, and we used to fish down there in the 50s. My my uh, my friend in the neighborhood on Fairview, he had he had to catch all the goldfish in the pond. So they had goldfish. Some of them were like a foot long. So he'd bring them home, put them in a wash tub in the backyard until they died. And then uh, this Dreamland Park, as Gary said earlier, was uh, an amusement park. Uh, and if you know where the tennis courts are and the tennis court parking lot, that footprint up there was where Dreamland Park was located. And uh, this is a picture that shows a bridge that goes over the west end uh, of Dreamland Pond, and behind it is a uh, dance pavilion. Um, the uh, other structures there, this, this park that was uh, opened up in 1905, and there was a dance pavilion and a refreshment building and a penny arcade and a bowling alley and a a band uh, was a bandstand was on top of the pavilion. They had a merry-go-round, a tilt-a-whirl, a, uh, a roller coaster. They had vaudeville acts. They had monkeys. They had a circle swing, which is a great big mast with cables that attached to some kind of cars. Because in 1905, uh, there was uh, there really wasn't too much going on in the aviation world yet, so they didn't have little airplanes. They had some other kind of vehicles attached to the cables. Uh, the primary access to uh, the park, to the amusement park, that's the bridge from another angle. Uh, pretty ornate looking bridge. Uh, I don't know when that bridge was finally removed, but I, I have a, a vague memory of seeing a bridge in the early 50s. And I, uh, someone else maybe can substantiate that, but seems like in my life there was a bridge there. Um, the primary access to this was by the West Main streetcar that I mentioned earlier, or by the El Dorado entrance and, uh, and uh, or hiking. And uh, there was one trail that uh, supposedly people were aware of and could get in somehow and not pay money. And so they tried to shut that off. Um, for example, one day in, uh, in 1906, they had more than 7,000 people that went through the turnstile. Uh, this, uh, they had a big roller coaster, one of those scary looking wooden ones. Uh, it had more than, uh, there, there it is. That's a phenomenal looking structure. As a kid, I wouldn't have been afraid at all to go on that thing. But I mean, if you look at it and think in today's context of safety, it's like, oh my gosh. Um, they had, uh, 2000 riders that day on the roller coaster and the, uh, they, they go back to that one of the balloon. Yeah, okay. This is a weird looking thing. It's, it's actually a lighter than air balloon. I don't know the dimensions, but if you look at the people on the ground, it looks like it was pretty big. And uh, I don't see where a person would, would fit on that thing, or maybe the basket is still on the ground and it hasn't risen. But they had this guy that they featured called Aeronaut Wild, W-I-L-D. And uh, there was an interesting story that told about how great a pilot he was and they said it appeared that he rose to 800 feet and then the winds became stronger and he was having control it, having trouble controlling it. And he uh, appeared to still be a very good pilot and handle things very well. And it said he ended up landing near the St. Louis Bridge. <laughs> so, you know, where that is, the bottom of Fairview Avenue, where the, the railroad goes towards St. Louis. 
uh, by uh, 1916, uh, financial failure was imminent. And uh, there were about eight to 10 investors. The city did buy it in 1919 for $15,000. And those 10 acres were incorporated into the park. And as Gary said, there was, uh, there was the camping thing, but uh, the camping died out when gas filling stations, they were called then, filling stations started doing, making their own uh, uh, campsites. And so I think the park was happy to get out from under that anyway. Uh, we don't know, uh, it, we talked about this yesterday, this one picture, uh, I think it was just a depiction of an Indian camp. I don't think the actual Native Americans were there, but I, I don't know for sure. I didn't see the article that accompanied this photograph. And uh, we saw it in another picture too. This is a winter view of the uh, pond and, uh, and the uh, bridge. And, uh, and here, I like this one because it shows you the amusement park. At the very top off of the, off of the uh, depiction uh, would be the pond. Uh, so everything here is where on top of where the tennis courts are now in the tennis court parking lot. And the, uh, you can see the roller coaster layout. Uh, you can see the theater. They had vaudeville there, vaudeville acts. Uh, they had, and then the uh, uh, dancing pavilion is the one closest to where the pond would be. Um, the... Um, <coughs> Pond, uh, as you know, survives, and uh, that's pretty much all I know about that. But it was apparently a great but short-lived venture. Gary, go ahead. All right, thank you. I I'm going to talk about the uh, new section of the park. I'm going to leave the uh, bikini tree uh, for Steve, and also Steve may want to comment on the bridges that uh, that, that we see in the uh, west in the uh, new section. But in 1930, the Decatur Park Board filed a condemnation suit to take 43.5 acres, as we now know uh, to be the, uh, the, what we call the new section of the park. If you were to look back into the Decatur Herald and Review back in the 20s and the 30s, <laughs> one thing that you saw many articles about, not just in Decatur, but our surrounding com uh, communities, was about condemnation suits. It was a time when they were laying a lot of roads and they were building schools. And so uh, local communities uh, and even the state were filing these condemnation suits to take property that was then owned by uh, private landowners. But it was kind of unusual. Uh, condemnation suits were really intended for necessities. And it was unusual for a condemnation suit to be brought uh, to expand a public park. But that's what the Decatur Park Board did in 1930. It was a very controversial thing. There were several articles uh, in the Decatur Herald and Review about it uh, as they followed uh, the, the lawsuit that was going on at the courthouse. Uh, there were several hearings. It was hotly contested. The three owners, uh, they didn't want to lose their land, even though it was more or less bottom land. Uh, but uh, uh, there was uh, juries that heard, heard the case in uh, two different parts, and they awarded uh, $225 an acre in one, $232 an acre in the other, which came to just barely over $10,000 for the entire uh, new section of the park. So, so as you drive through there, just think of the fact that uh, uh, the park was able to buy it. Uh, for a little over $10,000. And uh, as I say, the property owners didn't take it lightly and they appealed it. They took it up uh, to the appellate court, but uh, they lost there too. Uh, so that, that kind of gives you an understanding of uh, how the new part of the park came to be added in in 1930. And I'll turn it over to Steve now to tell us about the bridges and the bikini tree. Uh this bridge is actually, uh, go back to that drive that goes in. Um, yeah, that's okay. That's, I don't, this was the entry to the new section. And this is at a time when the interurban uh, 
uh, electric line uh, was still in existence. And it, its last ride it through Decatur, uh, it terminated in about 1955, I think it was the last car, the last interurban. But the tracks were there, and that was called the Belt Line. So now that's the walking trail. You can go to the next one or two. That, that's, that's uh, keep going. Yeah, keep going. And keep going. Okay. Uh, this is the, what I just showed you before, uh, but it's now as a walking trail. The piers are still there, and uh, there's lots of trees along the slopes now. You saw one of those pictures that showed it just after it was uh, made. Uh, the Works Progress Administration had uh, dug the earth out underneath uh, and made it possible to uh, create this bridge and create the road. So, uh, the <clears> thing <throat> right there, you can stop there on the bikini tree, <laughs> excuse me, uh, who hasn't heard of the bikini tree. And uh, I, I look at it as a swimming lady doing the backstroke. And this is probably one of the very early pictures and note how long the legs are in the bikini tree on this one compared to the next photos, which are <coughs> more contemporary. I'd say that the, uh, when did the bikini tree start? Well, it is a large sycamore tree. And uh, I, I would say that from what I've read that there are a lot of high school classes in Decatur and even Millican classes that have claimed ownership of being the first one to paint the bikini. But there was a May uh, 2018 article from Decatur Magazine that attributed the origin to the Stephen Decatur High School class of 1959 for forming a senior prank. Uh, that there's, there's some consistency uh, date-wise with how that might actually be true. And because the bikini started showing increasing popularity uh, in the United States uh, in 1960. And then of course the song Itsy Bitsy Teeny Weeny Yellow Polka Dot Bikini was a 1960 song that everybody can probably hum it a little bit and maybe say some of the words. Uh, this uh, bikini tree has had at least uh, three, uh, are there a couple more pictures there that uh, show, uh, there's a winter scene I probably took a year or two ago. There's uh, one I probably pulled off of uh, Facebook. And uh, <coughs> there, there's a, uh, there's one that was uh, when the Illini were really hot here uh, around the time of the Big Ten tournament and won the Big Ten tournament. And uh, so I like that version, but then it's already been painted again since then. So it's had at least three versions in the, in the last year. I think that Sycamore from just understanding a little bit about trees and tree growth and so forth is, is 80 or more years old. Uh, especially if you think that uh, 60 years ago was when the bikini was first painted on it, 61, 62 years ago. Uh, and that tree had to be moderate size at that time. So um, the, uh, you want to go ahead with the uh, uh, bears, Gary? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. So uh, a lot of us will recall in Decatur, at least back in 1970, if you drove through the park, you'll remember that we had bears and a caged enclosure, and there was a deer right behind the bears. And at one time, we had a uh, pickery pig for a time. Uh, but, but the bears are the things that, that, that really stick out in my mind. Uh, and, and, and in fact, in 1952, the Sertoma Club offered to purchase two buffalo to be kept at Fairview Park, but the park board declined and said the cost of feeding and taking care of the buffalo would run too high. So well, we never did get the buffalo. So how do we come to have bears at the park? Well, in 1916, Decatur uh, public school children collected pennies until there was enough money to buy two cubs for the park. And a cage was built just north of the big parking lot of, uh, of the uh, old section of the park. Over the years, the bears, uh, there was usually two or three of them, and the names included Teddy, Smithy, Bobby, Louise, Oki, <laughs> Noki, Pokey, Smokey, and Koki. Smokey is uh, said to have escaped five or six times. And in 1952, Oki climbed the 11 foot fence uh, and had some short lived freedom as well. Uh, the last bears were uh, donated to the park by Grant's Farm down in St. Louis. 
And on the night of November the 7th of 1972, uh, two youth broke open the cage and uh, one of the bears got out. The bear was uh, ultimately found in the 400 block of North Summit uh, among the houses. The uh, police and the park rangers tried to tranquil tranquilize the bear, but they ultimately had to put the bear down. And uh, the following <coughs> month, in December of 1972, the last two bears were sold to a Kankakee animal dealer. And there was no more bear bears kept in Fairview Park. It should be noted that the Scoville Farm uh, in Scoville Park across the lake was in its uh, early stages and, of course, became uh, the zoo. And so that certainly played a role in the fact that we uh, no longer had uh, bears kept at uh, Fairview Park. I might add that... Uh... I found this one that in 1952, Smokey and Pokey begat Oki and Doki. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you're looking at a picture now, the peccary pig. I don't know if he ever had a name. I'm sure he did, but uh, I don't know that I ever noted what his name was. Looks mean. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. So uh, those of you who are familiar with the park are certainly familiar with the tennis courts as well. Uh, Fairview Park. Uh, tennis courts has been the home of some very fine uh, tennis courts for close to 100 years now. Uh, I know that uh, Millican University practices and, and plays their matches there. There are uh, presently <laughs> nine courts there. Uh, it's, it's known as uh, the Harry Haynes Tennis Center. Uh, there's a number of tournaments uh, that are held, the Central Illinois Adult uh, Tournament and the Central Illinois uh, Youth uh, tournament is, is held there. The Ursula Beck uh, 22nd annual tournament is going to be held in Fairview Park again uh, the first week of August of this year. And now that's a men's USTA uh, circuit event, and they host uh, as many as 70 players from over 20 countries, and they're playing for a purse of $25,000. There was uh, there was a young man who won the tournament in uh, 2019. There he is, Jensen uh, Brooksby. Uh, he won first place in the tournament. Well, Jensen, uh, not only did he uh, win uh, the tournament here in Decatur, but he went on to qualify for another tournament and, uh, and won his matches in that other tournament, which then qualified him to play in the U U.S. Tennis Open, and he actually won his first round in the U.S. Tennis Open. So Jensen Brooksby uh, is a real up-and-coming tennis player uh, uh, on the national level, and uh, I don't know that he got his start here, but he certainly started getting some recognition right here in Decatur. That tells you a little something about our uh, tennis courts. We're going to talk about the uh, fun fair. Uh, the fun fair uh, was near and dear to me. Uh, I first went to the fun fair when it was at Johns Hill, and it was at Johns Hill in 1956 and 1957. But by 1958, this uh, this event called fun fair had moved to Fairview, where it had its permanent home. Uh, the uh, fun fair was founded by the auxiliaries of Decatur Memorial and St. Mary's Hospital. This is a fun fair cookbook for instance, that you could buy there and uh, contribute to their revenue. Um, the auxiliaries formed uh, or created Funfair as a revenue generating vehicle, which was highly successful. These are the ladies at Johns Hill when they first uh, started the, the Funfair. Um, the last year in the park was uh, 1989. These are people having a lot of fun at the Funfair. Uh, by 1989, uh, it, the fun fair uh, was no longer, except for there was one more year, 1990, when the fair became the Fun Follies, which they thought might be uh, uh, equally as profitable as the park version, and it was held at Kirkland Fine Arts Center, but uh, I believe it, uh, it was that one year, 1990, and that was the end of it uh, forever. Uh, some of you might remember that a, uh, a shaft broke uh, on the tilt of world uh, in 1987 was the year. And that's Mayor uh, Jim Rupp, right? Former Mayor Jim Rupp uh, uh, with the clowns at the fun fair. 
and uh, the tilt-a-whirl shaft broke and uh, 28 were injured. The serious injuries were uh, a broken leg and a uh, head injury. No one was killed. Uh, there were some lawsuits that followed, uh, but that did not, uh, the, the fun fair did have, the, uh, have a 1988 and 1989 version. So that accident actually happened 30 minutes before the Saturday closing time. Um, I always wonder about those uh, carnival rides, how safe they are. Kind of wonder. That is a, a friend of mine. I saw that article. Uh, Roswell Prince was an attorney here in town, and that's his wife Mary and his son is a very dear friend of mine to this day. So uh, they were just getting ready. This was a. a that, I, I like that picture. This shows the the man. I don't know his name, but he made all these beautiful signs, and these are engraved. These are uh, deeply carved into the wood and painted white. They were just beautiful signs. I remember uh, playing golf at Scoville and even the, the hole markers were, were signs like this with, with sawtooth edges and engraved uh, words and numbers. That's the uh, maintenance building at uh, Ferry Park. It exists to this day. This is its uh, new version. I don't know what year that was, but probably the uh, 40s. And this is a, I like this picture because uh, it's, it's kind of hard to see uh, if you're looking at it like I am, unless you have a little bigger screen maybe, but it shows uh, the park and, and, uh, I, and, and, but the far right, the far bottom corner right, you see a little island that's white and it says Deer Park. And at the very bottom of that, there's Park Place. So what this shows is that the original Deer Park uh, was at the end of Park Place in the park in what was called the Cato Tract, the 10 acre Cato Tract. And uh, that's all. This, uh, I like this one because the, the park, when you first enter the park from Park Place, and it's a one way, and if you went the wrong way on the one way after you leave Park Place, right embedded into the, uh, the hill, was this uh, spring and it was free flowing and uh, up above the hill and behind would be the very beginning of that segment of William Street. And uh, this, this uh, there were two reasons why it stopped. They put in this interceptor sewer to take all the surface creeks out of Millican and Fairview Park and put them underground. And uh, apparently that uh, somehow violated the uh, source of the spring, but then there was uh, Frank Torrance, who was uh, the original park superintendent, he said it was because uh, a coal shaft was sunk somewhere else in the not too distant, uh, not too far from there, and uh, that, uh, that intercepted. And, and so they had to go to city water after that. They were just relying on spring water for drinking. <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is the Lincoln Long Cabin. Um, I don't know if this is under miscellaneous. I think it is. Uh, Gary, did you want to go on and do the lantern parade? And then we'll show a few uh, Lincoln Log Cabin pictures. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to bypass on the bicycle path uh, uh, given our time, but I did want to talk a little bit about the lantern parade. The lantern parade has been a big deal uh, since the 1930s. Originally, uh, children were taking ice cream cardboard buckets. Uh, and, and then shoe boxes, and they were making, taking and, and making lanterns. So they would uh, cut holes in the container, and then they would cover the holes with uh, some colored paper, and then they would put a candle uh, uh, inside to illuminate uh, the bucket, and then the lantern parade would, would go on, usually starting sometime about between 8.30 and 9 o'clock as it was turning dark. And originally, the Lantern Parade was going through downtown Decatur. And the Lantern Parades have had as many as 2,500 children walking in the parade with their lanterns. And there's been crowds as large as 10,000 people watching the Lantern Parade. But the Lantern Parade in the 40s was moved to Fairview Park. And some of these pictures, you'll notice there were boats. And uh, they even decorated some boats and they would float boats out on the, uh, on the duck pond, uh, of course, by candlelight. And it was really something to see <laughs> these, these boats uh, lit up and, and floating across uh, uh, the duck pond. And the Lantern Parade has, uh, has continued. 
although uh, a few years ago it was moved to uh, Hess Park, and it's my understanding that at least for the time being, it's going to continue to be held at Hess Park. Back to you, Steve. Uh, just uh, are there some Lincoln Log Cabin pictures there? Okay, right. Uh, start off with that one. Uh, that one right there. I love that one. That's about 1932, and it's when uh, the Lincoln Log Cabin was uh, uh, had shortly before that been placed on top of Lincoln Hill uh, by the duck pond, where the cannons are and the borders and uh, the plaque honoring the Civil War. And in that picture, um, a, most of you probably can't see the detail, but uh, on the far right is uh, Walter Morey. Uh, who is an attorney here in town, uh, well known. And uh, there's one other name I recognize, uh, John McCowan, he's in there. And then in the very back, the tallest person in the very back on the corner of the house is Weber Borchers. He was the scoutmaster. And uh, a lot of you have heard of Weber Borchers. And uh, he, uh, he was the uh, scoutmaster of uh, infamous uh, Troop 3. Uh, and uh, uh, there's a lot more to be said about that, but not in this uh, and not in this talk. And are there some other pictures that show uh, the really old versions? That's another nice picture up there on that. OK, uh, just just in brief, uh, the courthouse in 1829 was in Lincoln Square, and then it got moved out to where the Pines <clears throat> Shopping Center uh, was. And then and then it got moved to Riverside Park along Lake Decatur. And then finally, it was in three different places in Fairview Park. And uh, there's actually, and it, it was in pretty bad shape. And uh, finally, uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps did a lot to help uh, refurbish it. And it's now currently at the North Fork Museum. <clears throat> Hold on. I like that one. That's about 1930s, I think. It, that's Weber too, isn't it? That I don't know. I'd have to zoom in. I never thought it was, but did you look at it? You kind of zoom in on it once and yeah. No. I don't no. know. For some reason, I just, I that's a great picture. That's just is. a great picture. It is. There was uh, uh, when the first place it was in Fairview Park was actually on lower ground uh, by the refreshment stand. And it uh, uh, there's a great picture we had. I don't know if it's uh, findable now, but it showed the uh, streetcar. OK, uh, there it there is. It is. Uh, the road in front of it actually splits and one would go up to where the tennis courts are now. And then the other one and then the other portion would go down around the lower part of the duck pond. But behind it is a streetcar and it's on the Dreamland siding. And that would be where William Street is today. But when those tracks were there, that was about 1909. That streetcar was operational and on its way to uh, Dreamland Amusement Park. Okay, Gary. Okay, well, uh, that that about wraps it up. Uh, hopefully, we've sure shared enough with you about uh, Fairview Park that you can recognize that the park has been an essential part of our community. Is there, as for the last minute or so, has anybody got any questions or comments? Maybe they would like to share with us. Hey, Gary, Mark Wassum in Dallas. Can you hear me? We can. Uh, Fairview Park, I grew up on Westwood Street, born Decatur, 1952, graduated from Millican University in 1974, MacArthur High School in 1970. So I got a little bit of history in Decatur, even though I've been in Texas for law school and my career. Um, I rode through Fairview Park as Brother Huss talked about the one-way street. Part of my paper route was on the other side of Fairview Park. What was the street the temple was on, Gary? El Dorado. El Dorado, El Dorado Street. Street, yes. So I had those two or three blocks behind. That was El Fairview Dorado. Place was one of the streets. Yeah, I'm sorry. Fairview Place was be behind the temple. And boys, I did that every day for three, four, five, eh, not five, four years, probably four years. And I have been in Fairview Park before I left Decatur probably every day of my life. And it is a, 
you know, what's the proper word? An icon, a, it was, it was something that I revered and it was just a beautiful, beautiful event in my life. And it's actually, it's a mile long, it's a mile long. I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear it. It's one mile long from isn't east to that, west. Isn't that amazing? That is, is absolutely amazing. All right, I want to go in an entirely different direction and go back to the tennis history of Decatur. When I remember there was this so-called smart ass kid from Belleville who would come up and play in our tennis tournaments most summers. And I think his name was Jimmy Connors. That's right. Does anybody remember that besides me? I remember the story that my friend Rusty Martin, the dentist, actually played him and beat him. <laughs> uh, that is great. That but their is... age difference was considerable. <laughs> Rusty was definitely older. Uh, yeah. That's that's funny. Hey, guys, I can't thank you uh, for doing the history on Fairview Park because it's um, an institution that will resonate in my soul until the day I die. Thanks for joining Thank us, Mark. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, guys, th everybody that uh, uh, watched, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Uh, stay tuned. We'll we'll have other uh, productions, other uh, discussions to, to share. So everybody have a nice evening. Steve, thanks so much. I appreciate uh, uh, everything. Uh, thanks, Becky, Gary, thank for you. asking. Sure. And uh, Melissa, as always, thank you as well. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks everyone for joining us. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Becky. And Melissa. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Bye-bye.